Hello and welcome to the CDCS participant training. My name is Jennifer Madigan and I am the CDCS coordinator with Ramsey County. This training will give you lots of information about CDCS, which is a consumer directed service for individuals using wavered services. You may be listening because you or someone you support uses CDCS now, or maybe you are hoping to use it in the future. Either way, hopefully this training will prepare you to be successful with the program. To understand um, what CDCS is, we must first understand what a waiver is. Um, a waiver and alternative care program, they provide home and community-based services to meet the needs of people with disabilities and older adults. Uh, they allow services to be provided in the home instead of an institution or group setting. Waivers include uh, the DD waiver, CADI waiver, CAC, VI, and elderly waiver. The AC uh, program is similar, but it's for individuals that are not on MA. The min choice is assessor assesses eligibility for these waiver programs. If you're currently using licensed supports under the waiver, uh, you hire support from licensed agencies to come into your home and provide that support. CDCS, the way CDCS works is that it's a service option under all of the waivers that offers people more flexibility. It gives them the responsibility of directing their own services and supports. It could include unlicensed support, like direct care staff that's chosen by the participant and services and items that are not available when you're using licensed services. Um, licensed services and MA home care services can be used with CDCS as well. But it just to be able to use unlicensed support is and to get some items that are not typically covered by the waivers is, is the reason why CDCS is so appealing to people. CDCS allows individuals to purchase services that will best meet their needs from people that they trust. So it's really a person centered program. In order to use CDCS, participants have to write a plan, and that plan needs to include what services are needed and the goals that will be achieved. That plan has to outline how will CDCS enable the person to lead a really inclusive life, to build a great network of support, and it has to include outcomes specified by the person and or their legal representative. Budgets. Um, the budgets for CCB and DD waivers, those are set by the state and they're generated by the Min Choices Assessment. So your case manager can get those um, budgets from the coordinator. The budgets for AC and EW, those are based on the case mix. And the case mix is also on the assessment that is done by the Min Choices Assessor. And your case manager can find
So who is eligible for CDCS? Uh, in order to be eligible, you have to meet the criteria here on this slide. First, you have to have medical assistance based on your disability. Um, you obviously have to have a waiver. If you've been convicted of fraud in the past, right now you're placed on a restricted medical assistance program and you're on restricted MA. And if you're on that program, you can't be on CDCS. You can't have a child or adult protection case open. And this is because in Ramsey County, when we look at CDCS, we really need things to be stable uh, since so much of this is really run by the managing party or participant themselves. And you also cannot be residing in a licensed facility or using foster care. So really anyone who meets the eligibility criteria that we just discussed in the previous slide is able to use CDCS. Uh, we see CDCS across all the different waivers, all ages, and all abilities. It really just depends on the person and whether or not they feel CDCS is the right option for them. One of the biggest factors in determining whether or not CDCS is right for you or the person you're supporting is what can be covered. What, what can CDCS cover? What would my, my services look like if I were to choose CDCS? And these are just some examples of goods and services that are available uh, or approvable under CDCS. Um, you are, there's ads and paper to hire staff. There are um, classes and trainings for caregivers and the person themselves, extra laundry costs if applicable, fitness programs for those that are older than 18 years old. Um, boy, it, the, the list really goes on and on. And there's another slide here in a second that will show you some more examples as well. Here are some more examples. Uh, paid parent or paid spouse, that's a big one. Um, as you all know, a parent or spouse cannot provide PCA services to a, a minor child, and the CDCS program allows parents and spouses to be paid to care for their loved ones. So that's a big reason why people choose CDCS. Home mods, um, therapies that aren't covered by medical assistance, social skills classes, um, you know, there's just a ton of different things that are available under CDCS or that can be covered under CDCS. It's really important, however, to keep in mind that just because you see something on these lists, it doesn't necessarily mean that they'll be approved for everyone. So each individual, as you know, has different needs based on their disability. So if you don't have a need for a service, um, then it wouldn't be approved. So for example, if you don't have a, a need based on your disability to get music therapy, then music therapy is not allowable for you. When you decide to use CDCS, there are several people involved in your team. Um, we'll start with the assessor. The assessor, they are basically assessing eligibility for the waiver, um, obviously, and the assessment sets the CDCS budget. Um, so if the assessor does a DD screening document, those, those codes that are put on, on that document uh, they're run through a system and that generates a budget. And that is again, just for CCB and DD, um, whereas ACEW, those are um, based on case mix and there's a document that you can look at to determine the budget. But anyway, I, it's important to know that the assessor is going to be um, determining eligibility each year or redetermining eligibility each year for the waiver. And that for CCB and DD, that their budget is directly affected by that assessment. The participant is the person receiving the services. The managing party uh, is the person who manages the services, and that could be the participant, it could be the guardian, it could be the parent, etc. So basically, whoever is managing the services, so the participant and the managing party, that could be the same person if the person is able to direct their own care. Um, the case manager, obviously, is the person who provides you with your Ramsey County case management. Um, they help you set up CDCS and so on and so forth. The fiscal agency or the FMS, that's the agency that manages the budget. Um, they pay payroll, they reimburse for items on the plan, they bill MA for all the services that are rendered, um, they do all the hiring of the, of the staff, 
all the background checks and that sort of thing. Um, and finally, the support planner. So a support planner is a person who is certified by DHS to help people with writing their plans and making any changes throughout the year if changes are needed. Um, so that those are the, the key players with CDCS. Now we're gonna discuss each role a little bit more comprehensively. So first we'll discuss the role of the participant or the managing party. When you sign a participation agreement on the CDCS plan, you're agreeing to the following per your role as the managing party. So basically you're, you're saying, I will develop a person-centered plan to assist with um, improving, developing, acquiring skills. I'm only gonna purchase things that have been approved in the plan. I'm gonna make sure that this person is healthy and safe. I'm gonna meet with my case manager semi-annually, send my plan in on time, send in addendums for changes. I'm not gonna overspend in any category. I'll work with the FMS. I'll review my spending summaries and I'll sign my time cards. So um, those are just some of the things you're agreeing to. And I believe there's several more on the next slide too. So as a managing party or a participant, uh, you are also agreeing to uh, not submit addendums within the last 30 days. Uh, this is because it really is difficult to um, review and approve addendums. Uh, we have as a lead agency 30 days to review. It usually doesn't take that long. But if you were to submit an addendum, um, maybe let's just say it's the last week of the plan, but we needed more information and it took you a while to get that information. And then pretty soon we're into the next budget plan or the next waiver span. And now we can't purchase that item. So we really need to have addendums submitted before the last 30 days of the plan, except for really you know, critical health and safety needs basically. So there are exceptions to that, um, but that is the basic rule of thumb. Uh, you're agreeing to assume responsibility for your unlicensed staffing for the training of that staff uh, and monitoring the staff and that sort of thing. And then for notifying your case manager when you're hospitalized so that we can stop services or make sure that you're not using services. When someone uh, goes into the hospital, wavered services need to stop because the hospital then is billing for services and it's consi considered double dipping. So uh, in addition, paid parents of minors or spouses, uh, they have responsibilities as well. Uh, they cannot exceed the hours approved in the plan. Uh, they have to understand that any income that they're receiving from paid parent of minor or paid spouse has to be reported. So if they're getting SSI, if they're getting food support, if they're getting cash assistance, you know, all of those programs where you need to report your income, though your income needs to be reported just as any other job. And they need to understand that salary earned could affect your MA copay and it could affect your eligibility for other income-based programs. So you just need to have that understanding and, and talk with financial workers and people at Social Security and things like that to find out how it will affect those benefits. Your case manager has a really important role in helping you determine if CDCS is the best option for you. In addition, your case manager provides you with training and guidance to open and maintain CDCS. They help you identify what can be in your plan based on the assessment. They provide you with your CDCS budget. Uh, once the plan is written, they review it and obtain approval for that plan. They provide you with resource information and assistance as usual. Um, they review your plan and get the approval. They monitor health and safety, whether or not that plan is appropriate. They are also responsible for watching the spending. So it, just like the managing party or participant is responsible for that, so is the case manager. They're, they're required to look at those spending summaries quarterly. And of course, they're responsible for carrying out case management per the waiver program. Now we'll discuss the support planner. Uh, support planner role was developed because DHS decided that because this is consumer driven, case managers are not allowed to write the plan. Uh, participants need to write the plans, but some people need or want help to do this. So uh, this support planner role was um, 
developed and basically they have a certification from DHS. They facilitate the development of the plan as directed by you, the participant or managing party, and they monitor and assist with revisions or changes as needed throughout the year. So in my opinion, and in the opinions of many people that I talk to, a lot of parents and loved ones that use, and, and participants themselves that use support planners, they're really worth their weight in gold. Um, you know, when you have a child or a spouse or a loved one with a significant disability, or you yourself have a significant disability, a lot of times writing the plan and, and getting the needed documentation to get something approved and kind of managing the budget and all that, it can be a little overwhelming, and especially at first. And so um, I highly recommend a support planner, at least for the first year. After that first year, you probably wanna keep them because they, like I said, they're just so valuable. Um, but of course you can write your own plan and you certainly should not feel that you can't do that. What does a support planner not do? <laughs> they're not there to monitor the spending. That's the participant's job or the managing party. They're not responsible for how the plan is implemented or training staff or anything like that. And they're not there to supervise time. Those, are, those things are basically on the shoulders of the participant or the managing party. The role of the Fiscal Management Services Provider or FMS is as follows. Uh, they do all the background checks and hiring of staff. They handle the payroll. They bill medical assistance for all of the services and supports under CDCS. They budget um, or do the budgets and reports for the services and items on the plan. And they monitor the spending and they send uh, those monthly expense summaries to the participant and the case manager. Once you've determined that CDCS is the right program for you, this is the process to get started. Your case manager will review an orientation packet with you that includes the, all the documents that you need to get a CDCS plan written and approved, CDCS policies and procedures, how to pick an FMS, how to pick a support planner, all of that. Then they're gonna check the eligibility for CDCS. Remember we talked about the five different things that need to, eligibility requirements that need to be met to make sure that you're eligible. They're gonna get a budget from the CDCS coordinator. Um, the participant or managing party needs to attend a CDCS training as you're doing now. Um, you also need to choose then a fiscal management service provider or FMS and a support planner. And as I said before, there are documents in that orientation folder to assist you with doing that. Uh, then the participant and support planner writes the plan. They submit it to the case manager who reviews it then submits it to the coordinator for approval. And once it's approved, the case manager will then submit the service agreement. And it's really important, I'm just gonna say this now, that, that um, participants and managing parties do not start services until the services are approved. We cannot go retroactive. This slide just gives you an idea of the CDCS renewal process. So it just kind of shows you each year how the whole process works. The Min Choices Assessment occurs two months prior to your renewal date. The annual meeting with the case manager is about one month before your renewal date. Number two, if you could see on arrow number two, the allocation or budget amount is, is received and that's received about the second week prior to the month the plan starts. <laughs> That's so confusing. These are automatically sent to your case manager by the 12th of the month. The managing party then meets with a support planner to write the plan and they submit the plan to the case manager who reviews and submits to their supervisor. Once the plan is approved, that plan is sent to back to you to the FMS and the support planner. Um, you check the pens and denials. Do you see, you know, make sure that there's not more information needed or nothing has been denied. And then uh, you review the budget summary that is then sent to you by the FMS just to make sure that everything is correct. And so that's just sort of the flow each year when you're on CDCS, how that looks.
Now we're going to talk about writing your CDCS plan. As I said uh, previously, everything you need to write the plan will be provided to you in that orientation packet provided by the case manager. Those documents can also be found on the Ramsey County website. If you go to the Ramsey County website or even type in Google Ramsey County CDCS, you should find that page. Um, also, I mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, that the support planner is highly recommended for the first year and a lot of people decide to use them year after year, but they're not required. If you choose to use a support planner, uh, they'll have all the documents you need. So you wouldn't have to worry about having those documents. They kind of run the show uh, for you in that regard, of course, with all of your input. Um, if you plan to write your own plan, there is a checklist and policies and procedures that will assist you with what you need to submit your plan. The CDCS plan should tell the story. So the more detail you can put in here, the better. Um, who is this person? What, where, what areas do they struggle with? Uh, these, these items that are on this slide are just some examples as to what you can include on your plan. Uh, do, what sorts of needs do they have with regard to walking, sitting up, you know, all the physical activities of daily life, um, cooking, cleaning, um, how do they, do they have issues with sleeping or how are their ADLs and IADLs, um, do they have special medical concerns, of course, what is their um, mental health diagnosis, if any, how does that impact their life, what are their vulnerabilities, do they have behaviors? Um, how do they communicate? Do they have, um, what are their skills with regards to community and being in the community? What kind of support do they need and what kind of things do they do, they do in the community and what's important to them? Each person's plan must include specific goals tailored to the person. So, what do, how do I write a goal? You basically have to think what will help the person live their best life. You know, start with what gets in the way of this person's life the most. What's the most difficult? And then try to set goals based on those needs. Um, what's the best way that we can help them work toward that goal? Are there services or therapies or experiences that the items that can be um, put in the plan that can help them work toward that goal? Earlier in this presentation, we had talked about some things that are allowable under CDCS. Um, so to determine what we can put in the plan, we have to discuss first what we cannot put in the plan. Um, what is unallowable? This is because DHS has provided us with a list of unallowable services and items, and then it's up to lead agencies to apply waiver policy to determine what is allowable. The next two slides will talk about um, unallowable CDCX expenditures. Um, these include services and goods that are covered by the state plan, Medicare, or other liable third parties, including education and vocational services. And so what this means is that if MA, Medicare, school, um, VR, if any of those places will cover something, then they need to cover that and it's not allowable. All travel, lodging, meal expenses, all of that stuff, even if it's related to the training for the person or the caregiver, um, cannot be covered under CDCS. Services and goods provided to or directly benefiting individuals other than the person who's using CDCS cannot be covered. So it really is for the direct benefit of the, the person using CDCS, otherwise it's not allowed. Services and goods that are diversionary or recreational are not allowed. These are things that sort of everybody wants or needs just, and it's not based, you know, kind of on the disability. Services and goods for comfort or convenience, kind of the same thing there. And then items that are normally provided by the person or his or her parents, family or spouse. This would be things like a parent helping a two-year-old child with toileting. Um, an Xbox, <laughs> for example, things that a typical family or or household would would be responsible for um, that doesn't have to do with you know the disability. Prescription and over-the-counter medications, compounds, solutions, and related costs 
are not covered. Um, this includes vitamins, um, dietary supplements, uh, premiums, co-pays, Tylenol, prescription medicine, that sort of thing. Um, animals, including service animals, unfortunately, and the related costs are not able to be covered under the waiver. Attorney costs or costs related to advocacy agencies are not covered. Something that gets asked a lot is what about guardianship costs? And the answer is CDCS cannot pay for, for those costs. Um, experimental treatments. So experimental treatments are not able to be covered under CDCS. And so that is why we have a form that a doctor needs to complete whenever somebody's asking for a treatment or therapy stating that it's not experimental. Fees incurred by the person. So th this would be um, fees for MA, co-pays, parental fees, things like that. We cannot cover that under CDCS. General vehicle maintenance is obviously not covered because everyone needs to maintain their vehicle. Uh, gym membership dues or costs for minors are not um, allowed. Home modification of a residence other than the primary residence of the person is not covered. Um, home modification that adds square footage isn't typically um, allowable under CDCS, except for when the lead agency requests a DHS approval for that. And the link is there um, for you to, to look at if you would like to see that. Insurance, except for employee insurance coverage for direct support workers. Room and board can't be covered. Personal items can't be covered. That would just be items that people get for themselves on a regular basis, like deodorant and toothpaste and things of that nature. Just you know anything that would be considered a personal item that any one of us might have on the day-to-day -day, uh, that we're responsible for providing ourselves. Tickets to attend sporting events and costs related to that are not allowable and um, vacation expenses beyond uh, direct service costs. So we cannot under CDCS cover the expenses incurred for staff to go on vacation with someone, and, but we can um, put staffing in the plan for that staff to support them on vacation. So for example, you go on vacation with your family, uh, you take a PCA with you, you are responsible for paying for the um, travel expenses and the food and all of that. And then the waiver or CDCS can pay for the staffing. So hopefully now you have a little bit of a handle on what's not allowable. And we talked somewhat about what things could be allowable as long as the documentation is there that it is needed based on an assessed need and on the disability. Um, for more information on what is allowable under CDCS, you can refer to the Ramsey County Policies and Procedures packet that's in the green um, orientation folder. That will give you an exhaustive, well, not really exhaustive, CDCS is very person-centered and we get requests for different things every day, but it will give you a really good idea of what um, is approvable under CDCS as long as it relates to an assessed need and it relates directly to the disability of the individual. Now we're going to talk about the different categories on the CDCS plan. There are five main categories on the plan and as we talk uh, specifically about each category. You'll learn more about what's available under CDCS because I'll get into what items belong where in your CDCS plan. So they are personal assistance, treatment and training, environmental mods and provisions, self-direction support activities, and MA home care services. Personal assistance is the first category in the CDCS plan. Um, this is defined as supervision or personal care. And some examples include staffing. Uh, it is the unlicensed staffing that you hire uh, for your loved one or for yourself if it's your plan. It is um, a paid parent of minor or paid spouse. 
Um, another thing that you'll see in personal assistance is respite services, and respite can look like a lot of different things in CDCS, which is kind of fun. It can be traditional kind of formal respite through a uh, 245D licensed provider, or it can be camp, or it can be um, auntie's house. You know, if you have your uh, sister and she is really good with her nephew and they go to the FMS and hire her to provide respite, she can be the respite provider. So it's really flexible with regard to uh, respite services. And then another thing you'll see often in personal assistance in that category is housekeeping or homemaker or chore services. I just want to mention something to consider when choosing paid parent of minor or paid spouse. As a paid parent or paid spouse, you wear many hats. You are the paid parent or spouse, so you're paid under the waiver to take care of your loved one. Um, you are also a parent or a spouse in that relationship with the person. You're the managing party, usually, the one who's involved or excuse me responsible for managing the services you you might also be the guardian the legal guardian and you're the person who decides what the best services is for the person you're supporting so just be careful um the one thing that i saw in my 10 years of social work uh, with ki kids or children as those kids got older those parents that were providing the the paid parent support um they really had a hard time letting go uh, they became dependent on the income and that's an easy thing to do so if the need changes in the assessment the funding will too and the parent will that that income will go down and so you need to be careful it's easy to become dependent on income we all get dependent on our income but it it's just something to remember that that assessment that's done as they make gains that budget can go down and your income can go down and it's and it's about supporting the person and not maintaining income for the family so that that can be a tricky thing to to manage uh, one thing i do did recommend as a case manager is you know as your kids especially with kids and i didn't work with adults and 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 it's a little bit different with paid spouse probably as far as letting go but as these parents that were staff were watching their kids get older and more independent that's exactly what we want to see happen um it started to get a little tricky because when the person wants to move out um is it really a great idea to have mom being the support staff you know so when that person wants to move out are they able to move out or is is it you know are that is that parent so de dependent on the income that that they're keeping their child home so it's just it's it's tricky and just something to to think about if you do choose to use paid parent to minor the next category in the plan is treatment and training some of the things that you'll see under treatment and training include staffing or habilitative services this is where staff are teaching skills they're not just assisting or doing for the client so staffing in this category needs to be habilitative um, and needs to be um, sort of working on goals to increase independence in in the different areas you'll also see alternative therapies these are therapies that are not covered by medical assistance like music therapy massage therapy hippotherapy things like that will be found in this section license services so when you're using cdcs the the cool thing about cdcs is that you don't have to use license services right but there might be times where you really want to or need to use a license service that is possible you can put your license services in your cdcs plan it goes in treatment and training um, another thing you'll see is caregiver or participant training this is training and education to caregivers and recipients The third category in the plan is environmental mods and provisions. Uh, these are supports provided to the person to maintain the physical environment or participate in the community or maintain health and well-being. So some of the examples include home and vehicle modifications, adaptive clothing, special diets, assistive technology, 
and mileage reimbursements, just to name a few, of course, there are several others that would belong in this category as well. And please remember that just because you see them here does not mean that they're approved for everyone, right? It needs to be based on the person's assessed needs. So we can approve adaptive clothing for someone where they don't need adaptive clothing, right? This is just an idea or an example to show you what, what goes in this section of the plan. Um, to get a little bit more into the home modifications, uh, for CAC, CADI, DD, and TBI, the first $5,000 of the home mod needs to come out of the CDCS budget, but then the rest of it is specially requested uh, by the case man manager to come from the waiver aggregate. So what that means is that if you have a $40,000 bathroom modification, you don't have to use your whole budget if using these waivers to pay for that. So you would, you would budget $5,000 in your CDCS plan, and then your case manager would assist you with applying for the other funds through the waiver aggregate. Um, unfortunately, or actually, let me go back for a second. It, the maximum is $40,000 a year, or with special request to DHS, we can, we can get uh, approval to use $80,000 over two years. Um, for elderly waiver and AC, unfortunately, the whole home modification or vehicle modification needs to come from the budget, and there is a yearly maximum of $10,000. Um, some, some things that you might see in a home mod or an adaptive bathroom, door widening, shatterproof glass, a ramp, um, and so on and so forth. The next category is called uh, self-direction and support activities. This is where all of the fiscal management service fees go. Uh, this is where the paid time off goes, employment costs like workers' compensation, support planner goes here. Um, sometimes people will put the cost for finding staff in their plan, like um, care.com or something, that goes in this section. So, but for the, for the most part, all of your fees that you're paying to the FMS for payroll, for PTO, for workers' comp, this is the category for those things. Here are just some really important things that I want everybody to know as they write their plans and as they plan for um, their individual, or if you're writing your own plan as you plan for your own services. MA always pays first. So if you need something and MA pays for it, you need to go through MA for that. It's not gonna be allowable under CDCS. Um, there are a lot of items that are, are gonna need supporting documentation. You can find out what supporting documentation is needed in that Ramsey County Policy and Procedures Manual. So that's gonna be really helpful to you as you write your plan. CDCS cannot cover anything that's experimental. I know we talked about that before, but I'm just gonna reiterate it here. It can only be used by the person. Um, we can't be covering family items. Um, the items requested must relate to an assessed need and they need to have a corresponding goal in the plan. So it, it all just needs to be tied together, right? If, they're, if you're asking for something, um, you've gotta relate that to why you need it based on your disability and if, you know, not for everything you're asking for, but for most, you need to have a corresponding goal as well. It needs to be cost effective or what you're asking for needs to be reasonable as far as cost is concerned. So if, you, um, if you're wanting to get an air conditioner, for example, and we don't do central air, but sometimes we can cover, depending on the disability, um, an air conditioner for a window, right? If you submit something that is $5,000, that's probably not a reasonable cost or, or what's customary in, out there in the world. So I, you probably would not get that approved and we would ask that you provide an option that is more cost effective. Um, and also, and I mentioned this before too, it's very important that you remember that anything on CDCS needs to be prior authorized. So if you submit a plan for music and music therapy is included in your plan and you don't get approval, um, don't start music therapy. We need to make sure that you are approved for that service before you start because we don't want you to be on the hook for the payments if it's not approved for whatever reason. So we cannot go retroactive with CDCS. It's always moving forward. 
Okay, so some other things to remember as you're writing your plan. Um, for paid parent, there is a max salary. Um, right now, it is $17.26 if you have PTO and $17.80 per hour if you opt out of PTO. Um, it can, and it also changes um, each year when there are COLAs. And, it, and you cannot exceed 40 hours per week. This means no matter how many parents in the home are providing paid parent support, and no matter how many kids in the home have CDCS and are receiving paid parent, the paid parent max for all the parents and all the kids is 40 hours. And I'm just gonna give you a quick example. Let's say mom and dad are providing paid parent of minor services to two minor children. Mom needs to work 20 hours, dad ne needs to work 20 hours for, you know, for all the kids. And so, so the 40 hour max is not 40 hours for mom and 40 hours for dad. And it's not 40 hours on this kid's plan and 40 hours on that kid's plan. It's a total of 40 hours, no matter how many kids or how many parents. For fitness programs, um, fitness programs with an alternative treatment form, adult member memberships can be covered under CDCS, but children memberships for children cannot. And that is because fitness programs are considered a responsibility of the parent for minor children. Hospital stays. So when you or your loved one goes into the hospital, we need to put CDCS on hold. We cannot bill for anything under CDCS while that person is in the hospital. So it's really important for you to remember if, you're, if you yourself, if you're writing your own plan, are hospitalized or if you're um, the person that you're managing party for goes into the hospital, you need to contact your case manager and no billing can happen for CDCS while in the hospital. That's really important. Overtime. Um, overtime isn't allowed with the exception of special circumstances. And it has to be planned in advance or prior authorized. Um, this is because it's not cost effective. Um, it's, it's not cost effective to pay time and a half. Um, you would blow through that budget very quickly. And so we need to make sure that a person's supports last the entire year and are meeting their needs. And so paying overtime is really not cost effective and it's really going to um, eat up their services pretty quickly. So uh, for planned circumstances, absolutely. Um, if you have a staffing crisis and you need to get an addendum or a, a change approved quickly, we can push that through and approve some overtime for you until another staff is found. Um, if you have a vacation every summer with family that you um, need additional staffing for, um, that can be approved. So for special circumstances and prior authorized overtime is okay, but as a rule, it's not allowed. So um, the IRS law 2014-7, I wanted to mention this. This says that if you were paid to care for someone receiving waivered services in your home, your salary is tax exempt. And so I don't really say much more than this because I don't really uh, wanna get into the business of providing tax advice or anything like that. But you can talk to the FMS, you can talk to your tax specialist. I know that they'll actually also go back a certain number of years. Um, if you didn't know about this and were providing services for a waivered services participant in your home, um, just know that you should check into this. Um, licensed services. Licensed services can be used in a plan. I did mention that, but one, but I did call it out here as well. PTO, every, every staff person um, that provides staffing, including parents and spouses, um, are eligible to accrue PTO. PTO is a great thing to have, especially for vacations, for hospital stays, like I had mentioned before, you cannot bill MA uh, while the person is in the hospital. So if staff, um, you know, if that person is in the hospital, that staff person is not out of work for that week that they're in the hospital. They can they can put in their PTO. Um, it's also not factored into the weekly max of 40 hours. So if they if a staff person works 40 hours and wants to um, then put in for some PTO that same week, they can do that. Um, so you can opt out of PTO after a certain amount of time with the FMS. Um, 
but talk to them first and 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 figure out the pros and cons of doing that because there are some really great reasons to stick with the PTO. Property destruction, um, we do sometimes uh, pay for items that have been destroyed due to behavioral um, outbursts and things of that nature, um, but it really is case by case and not all requests are approved. It's a very um, gray area here. So if you have a situation where something was destroyed, um, reach out to your case manager, see if, if it's something that we could potentially cover under CDCS. All right, so now let's move on. Let's pretend that you're you're done with your plan. Um, it's all written and ready to go. You're going to want to review the checklist that's in your orientation packet before you submit it to your case manager for approval. Um, there's a really detailed checklist that says, you know, if you're asking for a paid parent, you need to have a schedule and a job description in, included in your plan. Check. Okay, if you are requesting um, you know, hippotherapy, you need to have an alternative treatment form. It's, it, it really is a nice checklist um, to go through before you submit because if you submit a, an incomplete plan, it just will take longer for approval. So um, in general though, each item needs a description, a cost, and a goal or a description, a cost, and why that item is needed, okay? Make sure that the appropriate documentation is in there to support what you're asking for, like staff schedules, um, job descriptions for paid parents or spouses, alternative treatment forms, there's a property destruction form if it applies, there's special diet forms, things like that. Make sure the plan is signed, E-signatures are okay, so just make sure that you um, sign the plan. Whoever is the managing party, whether it's the participant or the um, you know, parent or spouse or guardian, whoever the man managing party is, they need to sign it. Make sure the health and safety plan is completed. Um, that is where each um, risk is identified and sort of what staff are going to do to help mitigate those risks. That's all in your packet. And then you give it to your case manager to review and sign. If you have a situation where multiple participants in your household are on CSG or CDCS, you must use the same fiscal management service provider and you can't exceed 40 hours a week per household. And so just like I had talked about before, no matter how many kids are in the household, no matter how many parents are in the household, um, it's 40 hours split between the parents and the kids. You're going to want to just notify your case manager and your FMS if this situation happens, and you're probably required to be required, excuse me, to submit a family schedule so that we can see that these hours are limited to 40 between all the parents and all the kids and that they're not overlapping. Um, the plan approval, <clears throat> I wanted to mention that once you submit your plan, Ramsey County has 30 days to approve it. So it rarely takes that long, um, especially, it could take that long, I suppose, for initials, just because there's so many steps to get things going if you have to open a waiver and all of that stuff. But for renewals, it rarely would take would take that long. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Once your plan is approved, you'll get it back um, from Ramsey County and everybody on the team will get a copy as well. And you'll need to check for any pending or denied items. You'll have a cover sheet or a notice of decision attached to the top of your plan that will tell you if your plan has been approved and if there is anything pending for more information or if anything has been denied. This is an example of the CDCS plan notice of decision or approval page that will be attached to the top of your plan when you get it back. Um, it shows you here that there are a couple of things pending and a couple of things that have been denied. As you can see, the horse therapy and the camp has been denied and it tells you exactly what's needed uh, to approve these items. For the horse therapy, they need the alternative treatment form by the doctor, and for the camp, they need information about the camp, what will happen at the camp, and the cost. Uh, below that, you can see that there are two things that are denied. 
the cell phone minutes. Cell phone minutes are considered a household utility and there's not a disability need listed. And then it shows you the lead agency reference there. And then a home security, monthly security payments is homeowner responsibility. There are less costly alternatives to meet the need for this participant and then gives you the lead agency reference. So that is what it looks like um, to have items pended and denied on a plan. If there were no items that were pended or denied, those would be blank and it would just be approved, signed and dated. Um, and then below that you can kind of, it kind of cuts off, but those are your appeal rights. So um, those rights, are listed there for you to appeal should you want to appeal the decision. Speaking of appealing, um, if an item on your plan is not approved, we recommend the first thing you do is to work with your case manager to find a solution that is within policy. So, you know, if something is denied, maybe the case manager knows of a solution. Maybe they know of a service or item similar that is able to be approved. Maybe we can meet the need in a different way. Um, if it's not possible for you to work it out with the, with the case manager and it just simply is not an item that can be approved and you still disagree, then you have the right to appeal that decision. Any decision that is made by the lead agency, um, you can appeal that if you do not agree. So if you want to appeal, there are your appeal rights right there. You're also going to get it on your notice of action, notice of decision, and you'll also get a notice of action, which will describe in more detail why the item was, was denied. During the plan year, you may have things come up that you want to change. To do that, you submit an addendum for approval to your case manager. In general, when writing your plan, do your best to anticipate what will be needed for the whole year. This is to avoid multiple changes to the plan because multiple changes can be confusing and really labor intensive for everyone. Um, addendums are not accepted typically during the last 30 days of your plan, except for critical health and safety needs. So an example of a critical health and safety need might be a piece of equipment that is needed to maintain health and safety. Um, but adding a, um, oh gosh, what? Adding a, a sensory item three days before the end of the plan, it's, it's not going to be approved. Um, another example, if you need more staffing in the last 30 days, staffing is critical health and safety, right? People need that supervision, that care, they need to be working on those goals that have been developed in the plan. I consider that to be critical health and safety. On the other hand, if you notice that you haven't used your whole budget and you want to increase the paid parent hours, that's really not considered critical health and safety. And the reason is, as parents, we provide care to our children, unpaid as well as paid. So if we're not paid, we're not leaving. So that's kind of the difference. Staffing is considered critical health and safety. Paid spouse or paid parent is really not considered critical health and safety because whether you're paid to provide that service or not, you're responsible to do that. So that's just kind of a, a, a little example. Um, we need to make sure that the addendum is signed or at least that you email the case manager indicating your agreement to the addendum. Um, Ramsey County has 30 days to review that addendum and return to you, though it will probably not take that long, but just to, to let you know. Make sure you wait before you spend. So wait for that approval before you start that service or you purchase that item. The case manager needs to notify you of the results of the addendum and, that, and they will send it out to everyone on the team. And then that FMS will send you a new budget, including the change. So you'll want to review that budget and make sure it's accurate. Let's talk about managing that budget and that spending. Participants and managing parties have to review the budget and monitor the spending to make sure that the plan is being followed and that we're not overspending. You can do this by signing up for the FMS's portal online, or you can request that the budget summaries are sent to you. Either way is just fine. I'd like to take a minute to talk about the CDCS budget. Um, for CCB and DD waivers only, if, if someone is eligible and meets certain criteria, 
you may be able to request a 30% bump or a 30% increase to your CDCS plan, but only in these four situations. So if you find that you need to add support um, for these four categories and your current CDCS budget does not allow you to do that, um, then you might be able to apply for more funding. So the first one is vocational or employment support. Uh, the next one is behavioral support, followed by moving into your own home. And finally, um, if you're transitioning from an institutional or crisis setting. So basically, if any of these apply to you, contact your case manager. The case manager will determine your eligibility and complete and send the application to DHS for that increase. Um, they'll we'll get a, a, a budget to you and then you would have to submit an addendum to add um, those funds and add those additional services. There is another group of individuals who are eligible for a budget enhancement. And those are people who are eligible for 12 or more hours of state plan PCA a day, or who have a home care rating of EN on their assessment. And so these individuals are eligible for a 7.5% increase to their CDCS budget, those funds are meant to go toward compensation or wages for staff that, that take a training to become a qualified worker. And so basically it compensates um, these staff people that work with very medically fragile individuals um, and, and the, the funding, the extra 7.5% increase is to go toward their wages. Um, Right below that, you'll see that there's a, a $500 stipend available to all paid staff, including paid parents or paid spouses. This is an effort to encourage better trained staff. And so I believe you can go to that e-module below if your staff or your, if you or your staff want to take this. It, you basically just have to be a staff person. Um, and a $500 stipend is available if you go through this training. And, and, and the last I heard, it expired June 30th of 2021, as long as the funds were available. Um, so this is the training that, that the folks I spoke of that are supporting those individuals that are, are eligible for the 7.5% increase, this is the training that they need to take to become a qualified worker. However, it's also a training that's available to everyone who is a staff person um, supporting somebody under the waiver. That $500 stipend is available um, for anyone to take that training. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about employment services in CDCS. So first and foremost, we must always assume that someone can work. Okay, so Minnesota is an employment first state. We are really dedicated to trying to err on the side that everyone can work instead of trying to decide all the reasons why somebody can't and letting those barriers get in the way, okay? So assume that someone can work until proven otherwise. Um, work will look different for everyone also. You know, work could look like five hours for one person who is significantly impacted by their disability, completely supported by someone, one-to-one -one job coaching, five hours a week, and that's what that looks like for that person. They're still getting out there, they're still being included in their community, they are still um, getting self-esteem and self-worth from that. Uh, they might not even understand what money is, but there are a lot of benefits from work um, other than just money. Anyway, it could also look like somebody who leads, needs very little support, who's working 40 hours a week with, with behind the scenes coaching every once in a while. Um, so just keep that in mind and really try to keep an open mind where employment's concerned. There's just so many benefits. Um, the licensed employment services can be accessed through CDCS, but they are cost prohibited. Um, always, always access bulk rehab first before using CDCS. And then when you're setting up your employment supports, try to think creatively. Maybe you can have an unlicensed staff person um, going out and helping that person find a job or providing the job coaching. Um, maybe they can purchase a couple hours a week of the licensed service and that licensed service provider can give all the knowledge and skills that they've learned um, to the unlicensed staff and the unlicensed staff can go do the work. It's just CDCS is very flexible. So think creatively.
Something else we need to cover is that because CDCS is self-directed, people might need or require technical assistance from their case manager. So if you're having trouble managing your plan, you might receive a notice of technical assistance. This technical assistance outlines the problem and lets you know what needs to be done to fix the problem. So you'll receive a written notice of technical assistance if your budget is overspent by 15% or more or underspent by 15, 50% or more. Um, if you use unapproved overtime, if you pre-sign timesheets, if you purchase something that's not approved, um, and you know, those are just some reasons why your case manager might send you a notice of technical assistance. Um, there are only four technical assistances allowed in one plan year. So when you get the fourth, that will be your notice that you will be exited from CDCS. Um, that rarely, rarely happens. Um, case managers give a lot of grace when it comes to the self-directed program, but CDCS is not for everyone. Sometimes people have a difficult time managing it and it's just not the best program for them. So this technical assistance, um, it's important to know that your case manager will send these notices when things are being mismanaged. So I'm coming to the end here of this uh, CDCS participant training, and I wanted to give you a, a couple more resources to learn more about CDCS. Um, DHS has a video explaining the basics of CDCS, which is a great thing to watch if you're new, but also a really good refresher. Um, and the link is there on your um, slide. And then to find out more about CDCS in general, you can go to the DHS link that I've provided here as well. So that concludes this CDCS training for participants. Um, if you have additional questions about CDCS or to talk some, to someone about getting started with CDCS, contact your case manager. Um, I also included my phone number, my supervisor's phone number and email addresses here on this um, training. However, if you could start with your case manager, that would be best. There are a lot of CDCS participants in Ramsey County. So start with your case manager, um, but I certainly am available as well. Thank you so much for your time and have a great day.